Hello and welcome back to another edition of Civil Discussion on GNET TV. I'm Andrew McKeever, the News Director at GNET TV's News Project, and it's a pleasure to have you with us today on Friday, March 8th. Also good to be back here with co-host Don Keelan. Don, good to have you back. Good to be here, Andrew. All right. Well, we're here with two special guests today who are joining us online, and who, they are no strangers to GNET either, I might add. We're really pleased and honored to have with us today Dr. Matt Dickinson, who is a professor of political science at Middlebury College. He's helped us in the past with uh, a lot of political analysis on uh, various elections we've covered and uh, topics that we've talked about. He's also the author of several books on the presidency. His current book project is titled The President and the White House Staff, People, Positions and Processes from 1945 to 2016. Uh, he uh, previously taught at Harvard University where he received his uh, PhD and uh, worked under the supervision of presidential scholar Richard Neustad and was a fellow uh, in the government studies program at the Brookings Institution. Uh, and is also, uh, as I'm sure many of you have seen, he's made several presentations down here in, uh, in Manchester for the uh, Green Mountain Academy of Lifelong Learning, or GMOL. Uh, so, uh, Professor Dickinson, good to have you back on GNET. Great to be with you both. We're also pleased to be joined today by Addie Lensner, another person who is no stranger to our programs here. She's been on several already. Um, she's a first-year student at Middlebury College and a graduate of uh, Arlington Memorial High School back in 2022. Uh, she's the founder and ex co-executive director of the Vermont Student Anti-Racism Network, and recently she was named one of the 2023 recipients of the John Lewis Youth Leadership Award by Vermont Secretary of State Sarah Copeland Hanses, in partnership with the National Association of Secretaries of State. Uh, this award, uh, a national award, uh, recognizes uh, uh, those who are 25 years or younger uh, who have demonstrated leadership abilities and have a passion for social justice and are motivated to improve the quality of life in their community. We were particularly excited about this because uh, Vermont Secretary of State, uh, Sarah Copeland chose to make that presentation of the award right here at this, at this very table on a recent show that will always rank as one of my favorite programs of all time. Uh, Eddie also serves as the secretary for the Benning County Coalition Board of Directors and is an executive fellow for Our Turn a youth-led movement working to dismantle the structures that limit access to quality education. So, Addie, welcome back. Thank you, it's so great to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. It's more fun when you were here in person, but you know, we'll get back to that eventually, I'm sure. So, um, we wanted to talk with you both a little bit about, uh, about free speech on college campuses, uh, about civil discussion on college campuses, and wherever else the conversation may lead us. Uh, but I, you know, I, uh, I had this idea that it, the two of you would be great guests to have on our program, uh, driven by some of the events I was seeing a couple of months ago, uh, not so much recently, but you know, again, go thinking back to, let's say, last fall and uh, over the winter, when it seemed like many college campuses were, were kind of being convulsed over, uh, over free speech issues and uh, particularly driven by the situation that we were seeing unfolding in, in Gaza and uh, in the Middle East with the uh, Palestinians versus Israeli situation, uh, the very tragic situation we're seeing happening. Um, I guess I, I just wondered if uh, your, your sense of things was that uh, that situation, those feelings of uh, uh, real edginess are, are still the case on college campuses. Perhaps, you know, we can start with uh, what, what is your sense of things up in Middlebury and then uh, broaden that out to, uh, you know, a more, more general uh, viewpoint. But uh, Professor Dickinson, maybe we'll have you get us started here. Uh, what is your sense of that? Is it, is it still a case where there's still a lot of tension and and, uh, and, and concern in the air between people who are approaching that issue from different sides? Well, I was at the center of two uh, previous incidents that put Middlebury on the map, uh, unfortunately. Um, and those involved inviting speakers to campus. Uh, and I think we learned a lot as a community from that. I don't see that type of uh, tension I, I do hear from students, and I'd love to hear from Addy, um, that a lot of the conversation now is taking place online through social media apps. Um, there were some open um, speaker events and some demonstrations on campus. I thought 
from what I heard, they were um, relatively well done. There was some disagreement about, um, I think, some of the things that were said. Um, the college has tried to encourage civil dialogue. Um, it's hosted a couple of events. But I, I worry a little bit, and here I'll defer to Addy. Some students have told me that online, the more vocal forces uh, voices have shut down uh, discussion. And so a lot of students just don't feel comfortable talking about the issue at all. Uh, and that seems to me to be problematic on a liberal arts community. Um, but I, I think in the classroom, I've had no problems having students engage. So I, I can't speak to how it's going outside the classroom on social media. I think I'd defer to Addie on that. Well, Addie, over yeah. to you. What's your, what's your take on that? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I, my roommate and I are very politically engaged, so we have conversations a lot about, you know, Charles Murray coming to campus a few years ago and what we think of that in terms of free speech and also what's going on currently. Um, and but I've noticed that some people don't feel as comfortable, like the classroom is one thing, but then when it goes to social media or when it goes to the dining hall, it's like a whole other thing. Um, and I think that, you know, on social media, it can be easy for some voices to be louder than others. But I think it's so important to have those conversations. And I have seen that happening at Middlebury. Like I've seen students very um, passionate and um like strong, strongly believing that we need to have dialogue and making space for that. So even if like people have opposing viewpoints, I've seen people having those conversations. Um, I know I have some friends who go to the, um, or who are planning to go to a, the Republican party meeting and they identify as Democrats. So like, there's a lot of um, trying to like balance out and, and talk to each other. So I feel like it is happening but it's definitely a time where I think it can be hard. The, uh, uh, professor the, uh, recently, the Wall Street Journal had several pieces uh, on this very subject and uh, where the students have been getting sort of blamed, if you want to use that word, for disrupting things and uh, preventing speakers. Uh, the Wall Street Journal and, and some of the commentaries mentioned the fact that it's been the faculty and the administration at some of the uh, 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 more prominent institutions that have blocked speakers and, and not necessarily the students. Is, uh, do you feel that's the case at Middlebury or, or not at Middlebury, but in general? Well, I'm, I have former students who have gone on to graduate programs at some of the other schools that have been at the center of these controversies, uh, Stanford, for instance. Um, and I, I get the sense that there are some faculty, some administrators who um, are leading the effort to um, block certain speakers from coming, but I wouldn't overstate their prevalence. Um, I think most faculty that I know of um, are open to um, bringing uh, speakers, even controversial speakers to campus, but I think you're right about the students. I think students want to hear diverse viewpoints, and I think I know in the incidents at Middlebury, there were some outside individuals who came in and I think agitated in ways that cast the stain on the entire Middlebury student body. Um, but I think most students, certainly the ones I know, are willing to engage, or if they don't want to engage, they understand that other people have the opportunity to engage and they're not blocking them. I think the college here where I'm most familiar with, of course, is Middlebury. I think we've learned. We've just learned from those incidents, and we're much better prepared um, to tackle controversial speakers. Um, and it may be, it's got to be a learning process at these other colleges as well. So just, just to build off a point Eddie was making there, um, if Charles Burry were to return, to make a return engagement to Middlebury, uh, you think that this time around, as opposed to what happened in 2017, I believe it was, uh, it would be a different situation. He would be listened to, and people might not uh, not agree with what he was saying, but you know, he wouldn't have to be escorted off the the podium. I believe that's right. Now, there's an additional issue that's come up, 
um, this, what's known as the heckler's veto, which is colleges have hidden behind the, uh, hidden is the wrong word, but they have cited security concerns. And this is what happened uh, with uh, Rizzo Legato, who was the Polish conservative who had come to campus. Uh, and the college simply blocked his speech because they cited security concerns. And I've talked to trustees, it's a real concern. You have to pay several thousand dollars. So, uh, you know, I worry about that um, being uh, a chilling effect on bringing controversial speakers. But I think from the perspective of faculty and students, if Charles Murray came back to campus, um, I'm sure there would be some students who would demonstrate, but they would do so peacefully. Um, and I think nobody would try to shut him down. I think a lot of students would say it's not worth hearing him. Um, which is in itself, I think, one of the most potent forms of protest, don't go. Um, but then I think there'd be some students who would go and would engage and push back on what he has to say. At least I'd like to think so. I'd like to think we've learned on this. But I do worry about that heckler's veto, that that argument that administrators make that it's the security cost outweigh the benefits of bringing controversial speakers back to campus. Uh, but frankly, why bring Charles Murray back to campus uh, unless he's got some new book out? Um, there's a lot of other interesting speakers out there, and it's almost like thumbing your nose um, by inviting him back, unless we want to prove a point. But um, I, I, we haven't been tested yet. Um, but I think if Charles Murray, if a club, the Republicans wanted to bring him back to talk about a book, I think it would go off without a hitch. Well, I wasn't going to mention... Charles Murray, uh, but I was going to use a, same, uh, a similar example. Uh, uh, Annie, what if I, you and I discussed the, f the fact that uh, uh, you and I just decided we want to have a discussion, bring a speaker in to, uh, who proposes going back to the uh, selective service, in other words, the military draft, and, and, and you were going to, uh, you're going to sponsor that. I, uh, and, uh, uh, where 18-year-olds to 25-year-olds are, uh, are subject to two years of military service, which went out of vogue several, uh, several decades ago. Uh, how would that be received at campus? How would, how would you be able to get that through? That's I'm a putting you on the spot on that one. But, uh... I think that um, there are some things I mean, just to quickly go back to what Professor Dickinson said, there are some things that I think that it there's a line drawn where it's not okay to call that free speech anymore. Like if you're talking about the bell curve and that racism is inherently a thing and that some people are inferior or superior to others, like that is dangerous speech. Like that, I do not think that should be given a platform, but I think that they should be allowed to talk, but like Middlebury shouldn't say like, oh, let's like ring them and support them. Like it should be like they can they can come and have a conversation. That's freedom of speech, but they shouldn't be given a platform to share those racist ideas. And to go to your question, Don, I think that um, if there was like a military draft, I think that if there was a group of students who wanted to see it pass and a group of students who didn't, um, I would see it happening as like a really kind of healthy debate, at least at Middlebury, um, between the two groups. I think, <laughs> hypothetically, if I wanted to institute a military draft, which, yeah, um, if I wanted to, I think it would probably be through peaceful, like, I think that anything done at Middlebury would be through peaceful protest. I don't think that anything would really get violent. Well, uh, what we're trying to say, uh, if uh, is the uh, uh, someone has a, a program to advance the selective service, and we want to present it to Middlebury, uh, would they be uh, welcome on the campus? Would they be allowed to do, uh, pre present that, or would they be blocked? Uh, uh, now, it's a very controversial subject, needless to say. Uh, yeah, I think. I do think they would be allowed, honestly. I think they they sh they would have a platform at Middlebury. Professor, how do you feel about that? Would they? I agree with Addie. I think they would probably have a platform here and uh, students would engage. Uh, but I want to go back to a point that Addie made earlier. Um, 
because it's a difficult issue to grapple with um, from the perspective of an educator. This notion of free speech versus hate speech. Part of the problem is, and I, I tend to err on um, allowing speech, even speech that pushes close to that line to be heard. I'm not sure where I feel on the platforming question, but one of the things over time, um, if you stay around long enough, <laughs> you see all sorts of things is, you know, in the past, gay rights were blocked. Speakers who advocated for gay rights were blocked from colleges and from towns because the experts said it was a mental disease. It was written right into the um, manual. Um, and the only way that gay rights has progressed from same-sex relations to same-sex marriage is uh, advocates for gay rights got a platform. They got a voice, even though the overwhelming public sentiment was you are pushing things that are um, dangerous. And so I generally, even in an era in which there's a consensus that something is hate speech or something shouldn't be heard, I tend to say, eh, I would want to risk it um, and give the audience the option of whether they want to hear it or not. But I hear Addie's point about the platforming um, and whether the college should be associated with some speech, uh, some viewpoints. Um, and, you know, that's something we we're wrestling with as a community, I think, what it means to to give a, a platform to a speaker. I remember in um, the Murray case and the Legato case, the political science department sponsored it. And students did not understand why we would sponsor those talks. We were co-sponsors with many other groups. And we explained sponsorship is not endorsement at all. Um, but for some students, that distinction was um, without a difference, really. And I think that's kind of what Addie's getting in. So I, I think it's a conversation that's got to be had. I'm curious. Um... Addie, you mentioned earlier uh, that... Uh... <sighs> When the conversations go online, they tend to get a little feistier, shall we say. Well, why do you think that's so? I mean, I've, I've heard this this theme has uh, come up many times in this, the programs Don and I have done, uh, where uh, social media is, is blamed for, you know, provoking all kinds of very hostile conversations that you wouldn't have when you were talking to somebody face to face. But for some reason, when you're online, you've got this shield and you can say things about or post comments or whatever that uh, you'd never say to somebody and directly to them. Uh, but uh, why why is that? Is that simply because of the anonymity factor or the fact that you're not seeing them? Uh, and, and how much more vicious are they, uh, the, the comments online as opposed to, you know, uh, a regular conversation? I mean, I would sort of compare it to like, um, like if you're sending a text to someone and you need to tell them, like, break some bad news to them, like it's easier to text them than it is to go in person and be like, hey, I've got bad news. But um, but I think that um, it's just an easier way to have conversations because of the not, not the, even the anonymity factor, but just the fact that, like, it's not as pressured, um, I think, is is the thing. Um, and I think that also like social media is a really great tool that can be used to further social justice causes. Um, I think it can also be used to dampen social justice causes. And I think that we sort of have to balance that out. Um, and, and that only happens through having those conversations, even if it is on social media and even if it does get like vicious or whatever, I think that we need to be having those because then that will translate to in-person conversations, which will then translate into tangible change. So I think it kind of starts on social media and then it can grow from there. Well, let me uh, follow up on Andrew's point. Uh, Professor? Do you see a difference between wh what's going on in social media discussions and when the uh, st students come into the classroom and have a discussion? Is there a different style? Is there a different tone? Uh, is there uh, less respect? Uh, 
Yeah, well, so let me be clear, Don. I don't engage with my students on social media beyond the occasional uh, excuse. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so I'm not quite, yeah. Addy's the expert here on how students are engaging on you know WhatsApp or whatever you're using now, Addy, um, for your various social media platforms. The social media I'm on, it's an occupational hazard, uh, you know, Twitter, now X. Um, yeah, there the conversation is, uh, it's the anonymity factor, the fact that the people who have time on their hands to post are usually the most passionate. Um, it has deteriorated tremendously over the last five to seven years in terms of, it's a lot of shouting past each other. It's a lot of um, outrage, X uh, posting, um, there's a lot of name calling. My students aren't like that in class at all. Um, and again, I'll let Addie speak to other classes, but in the last two weeks, we had uh, a rousing discussion in my Intro American course discussions on affirmative action um, and the Supreme Court's ruling, um, rolling that back. And just this last week, we did abortion and same-sex marriage. Uh, believe it or not, um, a lot of conservatives on campus who I, I don't think feel comfortable speaking on these issues on campus. At least that's what they tell me. But in class, they come right out. Um, so my experience is the type of engagement that we like to see is still happening, uh, at least in my classes, and I hope in Addie's classes as well. But social media, at least the social media I'm on, is much different. It's yelling at each other. It's outrage. Um, there's not a lot of conversation going on. Addie, how do you, uh, what about in your classes? No. Yeah. Um, I'm taking a class called American Public Policy, and we have really good discussions um, that are um, not really heated at all. It's more just a general discussion, and um, people feel pretty comfortable sharing their viewpoints, um, given I think it's a pretty liberal class, um, because I think a lot of the students in the class share viewpoints um but i think that when there is a student who disagrees they're comfortable sharing out so i think that the classrooms really foster that space where students are comfortable to talk about it um i wanted to sort of ask both of you what, what you thought the boundary line was uh between free and fair speech and and hate speech um i was on a zoom call the don had organized uh, with uh, Former Governor Jim Douglas, one of your colleagues in the, in the at, at Middlebury, uh, and he made a point which I thought uh, kind of uh, worked for me, uh, which was that uh, when when speech tips over into encouraging violence or some kind of uh, very aggressive action, maybe that's you know uh, physical violence or or <clears throat> violence in another way. That's that's where that that speech becomes no longer let's say, protected by the First Amendment in some way or another. Uh, does that sound like a, a, a kind of a, a common sense sort of boundary line to both of you? Or, uh, you know, is it just so such a nebulous kind of thing that it's really hard to say, well, it's okay to say this, but when you say this plus that, we're, we're kind of getting into a bad place. And Professor Dickinson, maybe I'll, I'll ask you to start. You want to start, uh, Professor Addie, Dickinson? Uh, Addie, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I think I've heard the example of like shouting fire in a movie theater. Like that is a pretty general example, but like that is obviously dangerous. You that can cause a lot of turmoil, and you probably shouldn't do that. Um, so I think that there is a line where it becomes violent and where it becomes hate speech. I think where that line is drawn is the thing that's really blurry and people have arguments around because um, people have different definitions of what counts as hate or what counts as violence. Um, and so it's kind of contested, but I feel like if anything, well, I, if, if anything calls for something that can tangibly be seen as violence, I agree that that should not be allowed. Um, and we should address that because otherwise um, it's inciting violence. You know, I would add a, a speech that's directed at somebody in the audience personally. Um, I think it's crossing over a line. You can discuss very controversial issues um, without personalizing 
the discussion. Um, and I, th I think that's where I worry when speech is directed, derogatory speech at an individual. Um, and again, I'm with Addy, it's difficult to draw the line ahead of time. The college has a speech code that's roughly modeled after the idea that um, the Supreme Court ruling um, in a, a, a case dating back a number of years is in an immediate incitement to violence. Um, that type of speech is not allowed. And the college speech code is something like that. But for instance, there were a lot of posters put up on campus on various sides in the Hamas-Israeli uh, conflict that were torn down. Um, and I think some students tore them down because they thought they crossed the line somehow um, and in the heat of the moment. But I don't think they crossed the line. I think that that's where we get into sort of a dangerous territory here. Um, and so, you know, it's one thing to enunciate a principle. It's another one in the heat of the moment with passions running high to sort of stick to that principle. And I, I would like to think that we could do it here. Um, but on the other hand, we haven't always done it well, um, but I think we're we're doing better at explaining ourselves to incoming classes. I mean, I don't know if Addie's been uh, what the orientation process was, but in my intro course, I now tell students, um, you know, that a lot of the issues we talk about are going to involve viewpoints that you might find uncomfortable. But that's why you're here. That's why you're at a liberal arts college, um, and so use that uncomfortableness to inquire about why someone else has those views. If it's done in a moderated perspective, I think students understand that. But, you know, they're coming here from all different backgrounds. Um, not all of them have been exposed to the type of debate that you often get at some very good schools in high school. And so they don't understand really why we would engage in this. And so you got to teach them. Um, but even the teaching is there's room for disagreement. And I, I just heard what you said about the introduction. But now let's say you're, 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 you're th you got a third year class or a fourth year class. Uh, how do you, because our show is directly related to civil discourse and we try to get folks on that, that disagree with each other and, and to try to find a common ground, but also to have respect for each other, to listen to each other, to um, uh, uh, you know, not talk over each other. How do you maintain that in your class? Well, I think the students, um, and you won't be surprised having heard Addie, that the students are very good at this. They self-police, they want to learn, they want to engage, um, and they want to do so in a respectful manner. That So I don't really have a problem in the classroom. I think students understand the rules of the game. Um, and on the rare occasion in my 30 years of teaching in, in which I thought a student crossed the line, a very gentle reminder, hey, don't personalize it, um, is all that it took. It's outside the classroom that um, things can get a little more heated. And there, frankly, um, you know, there's a subset of students, I think, who um, it's it sometimes the conversations get more difficult to have but even here i think the majority of middlebury students understand the need to have those conversations i just wanted to ask one last question on the subject before we shift over to uh, the civic engagement uh, aspect uh, i guess i just wonder what you both thought uh, uh, of what the four college presidents who testified before congress back last uh, october i guess it was or november uh, and who came in for tremendous rounds of criticism uh, for uh, for what they said or didn't say or attempted to say under the guise of it, it's all about the context. And two of them, if I'm thinking correctly, now are no longer college presidents. Uh, uh, they all kind of took a real beating in the in the media uh, over what they said or didn't say. I guess I just wonder what what, what did you both think of what happened and kind of uh, the aftermath of all that was it were they just unprepared uh, or did they really bungle it or were they trying to kind of be reasonable and and walk walk the fine line between free speech and hate speech or 
What do you think? Patty, you want to start or? Sure. I mean, I feel like I don't, um, I don't know too much about it, um, but I think that when something is hateful, you can't just let it slide. And also when there's something as serious as going on, like what's going on now, um, it's really important to be intentional and like, um, and ensure that you're like, not promoting more violence or not promoting more hatred. Um, and I think that like, I don't know too much of the details of what happened with the college presidents, but I think that like it, it's, it's easy to say something and then regret it, but you still need to be held accountable for what you say. Um, but I don't know. So I, um, and Addie just went to one of my weekly politics lunches. Uh, I hold these weekly politics lunches and we spent considerable time um, when these events were happening, talking about them. And one, and I talked to some uh, trustees as well. And I think one of the things that President Patton has sought to do, not always successfully, is try not to say anything uh, uh, publicly about some of these controversial events. And, uh, and it, it raises the question, what is the job of a college president? Um, should you be opining on these, on taking a side on these issues? Um, and I think there's an argument to be made that maybe they shouldn't be. Um, that's not their job to interject them, uh, their viewpoints in here. Having said that, um, full disclosure, the former president of Harvard, Claudine Gay, was a former student of mine. So I'm not completely unbiased here. I have deepest empathy for her. But that, that hearing was a political ambush. She came in prepared by a law firm, um, and it was bad preparation. Um, for something that actually was a political theater. And so technically what she said about hate speech, well, it depends on context and time, um, was correct. If you look at the Harvard uh, speech code, but that's not what was called for then. When you're asked, is genocide of the Jews acceptable uh, speech? You don't lawyer around the issue. Um, even though it sort of makes sense, um, you know, from a, a strictly, this is what the policy is, you express outrage. Um, and so, you know, that in some sense, they brought it on themselves. And in, in Claudine's case, it was complicated because of the charges of plagiarism, which eventually made her situation untenable. Um, but I think you know, they were put in an unfortunate place. I think they got bad advice. But the broader issue is what should a college president's role be in these um, discussions that are the very divisive and very polarizing? Um, and I think you need to establish a policy early on and stick to it uh, as a college president um, and determine, you know, how do I, you can't selectively intervene and say, I'm outraged by, um, George Floyd um, and say nothing about Hamas attacking Israel or vice versa. You, I think you really need to, um, and I'm using these as hypotheticals now, um, I think you really need to establish a policy. And I think probably the best policy is, it's not my role to take a stand on these controversial issues. It is my role to facilitate an atmosphere in which my students can learn. Well, uh, let me follow up now with that, uh, Addy on that. <clears throat> you, you do a great deal of work on anti-racism in the uh, high schools uh, in Vermont. Uh, uh, how do you how do you work, do that work w without uh, becoming divisive, or do you do you you don't care whether you are divisive or not? You, you're gonna you're, you're, it's your end goal that's more important. Um. I think there is a point when you do have a responsibility to say something, even if it doesn't seem like it's your place. Um, I think that we all, as part of this community, have a responsibility to speak up when we see injustice, whether it's 
abrupt right in front of us or systemic or whatever, whether it's what's going on um, in Gaza or whether it's what's going on in America with systemic racism. I think that people have uh, to speak up. And I think that when I go into schools, what I try to do is present things in a way that is not like purposefully very divisive, but really just start to have conversations and really ask questions and get the students to talk about it and say like, well, what do you think about this? And then they share their viewpoints. We share ours as students and have a discussion, um, but not really trying to like provoke anything, just telling the truth. And the truth shouldn't be divisive is what I believe. Um, so that's what we try to do and, and really, um, promote conversation around history and what has happened and what is happening. Mm, interesting. Um, boy, we could uh, probably keep talking about this for a lot longer, but I, the clock is ticking and I wanted to have it give us enough time to kind of uh, talk about part two of our conversation here, which is your, your takeaways on where you feel uh, civic engagement uh, in the political system at the moment, uh, where that stands if it's better or worse in the, than it may have been in the past. And uh, I don't know, uh, and if, if there's things that we need to improve, what, what, what might those be and how do we do it? Uh, I guess, uh, Addie, I'm gonna like go, go back to you here real quick uh, for, uh, just to get us started on this one. Um, since, uh, you know, I guess one of, the, one of the, the most basic metrics, I suppose, of civic engagement uh, is voting. Uh, how often you get to the polls and actually vote. Uh, <clears throat> we just had a town meeting and a presidential primary here. Uh, the, the voter turnout was uh, better than usual, uh, quite a bit better than usual, but it, still in most, most towns, or at least around here, it barely got up to around the 50% mark, which I guess, you know, uh, historically, that, that's pretty good, or that's about average, or, or slightly better than average, but still that means that half of the people on the checklist didn't vote. And so that doesn't seem so good either. Um, I guess I just wonder what do you, what do you, and maybe I'll, I'll focus the question a little bit more. Folks in in your age group, uh, you know, uh, twenty to thirty year olds, uh, what do you uh, what do you sense? Do you feel like uh, you know we have a, a very probably very pivotal pres presidential election coming up this November in twenty twenty four? Do you feel that there's a lot of interest in that uh, and your friend saying, yeah, I am definitely going to be voting this year. I'm not setting this one out. Yeah, I, I mean, I, first off, I want to emphasize that this election is, it could determine a lot of things in American society. And um, it's really important to get out there and vote. And that's what I'm trying to stress to my peers. And I think a lot of them have said, like, yeah, I'm definitely voting in the presidential election. Like I have a friend who's going to Chile um, in November and he's like, yeah, I'm getting a ballot sent to me. I'm voting. There's no way I'm not voting in this election. But at the same time, like I went to vote in the primaries with my friend and we were the only young people there. We were the only young people at town meeting day the night before. Um, there were a few other young people, but like it, it, there's not that much engagement outside of the presidential election. And I think that that's an issue too, because if we want to have like an engaged community and a society that's like inclusive, like it's important for everyone to be involved, not just in the presidential elections, but all the time, but this year, especially in the presidential elections. So I think that with young people, um, I do have hope that like we're showing up. Um, but I think that there is a little bit of fatigue and a little bit of not knowing if it's actually going to make a difference. And I think that's what we need to combat because it will make a difference. And anything politically that a young person can do would make a difference. Yeah, I would just echo everything Addy said here. Um, we know younger uh, voters are, or young people, 18 to 24 are the group that votes at the lowest rate. Um, it's not because of apathy. Well, it is um, a number of factors, some structural. Uh, registration is a huge issue um, in states that allow you to register same day, like Vermont. Uh, voting among youth is higher than states in which you have to register three or four weeks before the election. A lot of students have to vote by absentee ballot. They don't remember um, that they have to do that. 
But I would point out, thanks to efforts like by Addy and others, Middlebury College has an incredibly high participation rate, um, uh, uh, and we do pretty good. And we've we've been engaged in that. Um, there's a democracy initiative group on on campus, but there are still things we can do. We know mailing ballots directly, um, although town clerks drive them crazy. <laughs> uh, that will increase turnout. Um, you know, there are countries that do automatic registration. We do not. We put the onus on our, our individuals. So that's something we might be able to explore. Um, but, you know, people, I think there's been a generational, and Addy can speak more to this. I do worry that there's um, a, a, a tendency for some younger voters to get discouraged, to, to think things are going bad, uh, and why bother? And it's not. I mean, there are a lot of problems, and Addy's quite correct. The presidential election is one of them. But, you know, all the statistics show things are getting better. Um, and we don't speak about that enough. It's not that we can't improve, but the climate is getting better. Water is getting better. Uh, race relations are 100 percent better than what they were when I was Addy's age. Um, we are making progress, but it requires participation. Um, and, you know, we need activists like Addy to to get people to participate. Um, but we also have to make, we have to run candidates who speak to the issues of concern to young people. And I, I'm not trying to be ageist here, Don and Andrew, but running an 81 year old against a 79 year old uh, doesn't speak well to, you know, who's the next generation of leaders that are gonna reach out to attract the younger voters. And um, so there are a lot of things we can do. Um, but I, I wish we would not be so pessimistic about the state of affairs in this country. Uh, or how do you, how do you, uh, uh, if I can jump in. Uh, uh, because you're, you're also, as, as you mentioned, I believe, an historian. And uh, how do you feel things are today? Uh, are they similar to what we went through in the, in the 1960s? Uh, uh, I was a little bit older than Addy, uh, believe it or not, in the 60s. But I experienced the civil rights uh, issues before we had civil rights. I mean, where there, it was actually flat out segregation. And uh, we had a, uh, a candidate running for president uh, from Alabama, bl literally blocking a student from coming into the college uh, or the university. Uh, we had a Vietnam War. We had terrible uh, uh, you know, federal spending and the changing of the government to the great society. And then we had a president who decided to resign. Uh, not resign, but uh, I'm, I'm ahead of myself, uh, not run again, and that was President Johnson. Uh, so things were not looking very positive in 1968. Uh, and uh, so how do you feel they are today relative to that, uh, that period? And in the 60s, you had urban riots, um, which we have not been seeing. Um, you know, it's... I just think we're in a, a far better place. Um, same sex relations are now institutionalized and recognized by law. Women in many areas, for instance, college education are out uh, numbering men now. Um, the race relations have improved a thousand percent. And again, there's a tendency to look at how much more we can do. But it's, I think, Don, what you say is useful to take stock to see how far we've come yeah. and to think back. Uh, at the time when we were in the middle of that, we thought we might never get out of it, that the country was coming apart at the seams. So I have great faith uh, in our ability, um, thanks to people like Addy and the next generation, to address these problems, to get involved. The one thing I think that's changed, Don, is the way we, the polarization of the parties, the activists are increasingly speaking past each other. Um, about issues that aren't relevant to most Americans. And I think that's a potential problem here. You know, if our choices are deeply polarized and if you're speaking about issues that aren't issues of concern to rank and file voters, you know, there's no guarantee that we'll continue to move forward and make progress. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. I do think we're much better off now than we were 40 years ago, but let's meet again 40 years from now. And, and, and take stock of how well we've addressed the issues that Addie's been striking, uh, talking about and, and uh, in her visits. Um, you know, we've got a lot of ways 
a, 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 we got a lot of room to uh, for improvement. Let me let me just add one thing. Well, what's missing from my uh, uh, analogy, uh, analogy, if you will, is social media. We did not have social media back in the sixties, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, and whereas today, and I agree with you, Professor, things are so much better, especially from my viewpoint. But I gather I don't I, I don't really understand the real impact of social media is having on all of this. Well, that's a worry, Don, I have. Uh, and the, the one drawback, I think, to social media, Addie alluded to it earlier, uh, it does give a mouthpiece for the loudest voices. It can be a tool for organizing, but it does give a mouthpiece for the loudest voices. But it also, it strips away the insulation. Um, it's one thing when you had to wait for the papers, um, or maybe you, you might watch one of three broadcast news, but now everybody has a platform. Everybody can insulate themselves from viewpoints they don't like. Uh, it, it, it makes uh, responding on the spur of the moment to things much easier. And that's not always good for discourse. Um, uncontrolled, pure democracy <laughs> happening on social media. You remember the framers were very worried about that. They built a political system that was designed to insulate our our leaders from direct interaction. And now we have leaders. If you saw the State of the Union, I mean, they're live tweeting their thoughts on the State of the Union from the floor of Congress uh, to their donor groups um, and on, to their Twitter feed. Uh, I don't know if that's good. Don, I don't know if that's good. I, I think Addie has pointed out some of the positive aspects of it, but I do worry about the negative ones as well. Before we before we go, uh... sir, I definitely want to get your take on the well, both of you like your, both your takes on the on the State of the Union address last night. It was I didn't watch it, and I deliberately didn't watch it because I didn't want to go into that black hole of uh, depression, which I've sort of been feeling a lot of lately. But I. I guess I just wanted to kind of ask both of you, uh, and maybe Adi, I'll, I'll, I'll get, have you get us started here on this one. Uh, why, why is there? Do you feel there's a sense of pessimism amongst uh, folks in your age group about the future, and that uh, you know things are just sort of uh, spiraling downwards, or, or there's uh, the hope for the future just seems to be something in short supply? Is that your sense of it? Because uh, I, I definitely have been feeling that way myself, and. Uh, and I often, I, I kind of, I just kind of worry, you know, gosh, we can't break out of that, that feeling, uh, you know, things will, despite the fact, as the professor pointed out, you know, by a lot of economic measures, we are in a much better place than we were, I don't know, pick whatever point you want. Uh, the unemployment rate is at a near record low, and it's been that way. Inflation is finally beginning to trend down. Um, but uh, there still seems to be this feeling of, of, of pessimism. I just wonder if that's a feeling you're getting from your friends. Yeah, um, I do definitely feel that there's a sense of pessimism. I think um, like things have gotten a lot better in history, but I think we, and I know Professor Dickinson, you said focus on the optimism, but we do have a long ways to go. Like the, for example, the prison population in Vermont is very inequitable. Like I think black Vermonters are like 11 times more likely to be in prison than white Vermonters. And that's not something we can just say, oh yeah, like that is just systemic. Like that's part of history and we still haven't fixed that. And I think that that is contributing to part of the pessimism that a lot of young people are feeling plus um, events that are happening outside the United States. And I think that young people just want to see more action um, and want to see more deliberate discussions and deliberate engagement on these issues because I feel like a lot of times we don't necessarily see that and that leads us to feel more pessimistic about our future and that leads to not wanting to vote because it doesn't matter and it's this continuous cycle but I think that we need to, like Professor Dickinson said, focus on the good things and also focus on how we can fix the bad things and move forward together. And I think that President Biden tried to do that last night in the State of the Union, um, tried to uh, focus on, OK, how can we move forward? And I think that we need more of that and we need more of that. Um, we just need more of that forward thinking and empowerment of like we can fix things and you can start by voting. And that's how you can start doing that. 
I wonder if I might quickly ask Addie a question. Um, one thing that I've noticed in my years of teaching is the level of mental health stress that students are under, at least by objective measures and, and conversations I'm having has gone up. Um, and uh, getting to Don's point, I do wonder, I don't know what it's like to grow up when you're, I, I don't know if self-validation is the right word, but your presence online and how people react to it is some, in some respects, more important than your interaction physically with individuals because you're spending so much time online. And I wonder if that is contributing to uh, mental health. I, I had an incident where a student had a falling out with another group of students over something that was posted online that was taken the wrong way. And the next thing I know, they're litigating each other. Um, Addie, I mean, am I overstating this or is is there, are you under a lot of pressure or your generation um, via social media? Yes, we definitely are. I think there's definitely a mental health crisis among young people and just people in America. And I think that social media exacerbates it. I think it goes both ways, though. I think during COVID, like there was um, a lot of ways that social media was used to connect people and keep people connected and support mental health. But I think that it can be dangerous in that, like, ideas can spread fast, hate can spread fast, um, things can be misconstrued over social media, like, you don't have the full context, and then it can just get ugly. So I think that social media does contribute to negative mental health. I think we have to sort of reframe it and um, and use it for, for good, I think, um, and, and have more in-person conversations also, like, we can we can get past the screens. I know we can do it. You're here. Good. Yeah. The uh, uh, I I, I want to deliver a, a little bit of optimism, uh, Addy. I mean, uh, I want again. I want to go back to the uh, the '60s uh, uh, because um, uh, you know it it, it 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 can launch us to some of the good things that, that are going on now, notwithstanding social media which I, I, I fully don't understand the, the full ramifications of it. But when you think in, in, in 1960 and, and 61, uh, when I was in college, my, uh, my classmate could not get it. Uh, when I went into Price Waterhouse and Arthur Anderson, uh, they uh, informed her, uh, she, uh, she's a woman, she can't get a job. We don't hire women. I, going to Camp David uh, a year before when I was with the, uh, the Marines, the four black Marines couldn't get off the bus to have Chow in Fredericksburg and in, in Hagersburg, Hagerstown, Maryland. I, the uh, uh, and, and, and there's, and there's so, so many uh, other things that occurred. And going back to what the professor was saying, if you were gay in New York City in the 1960s, you could be arrested. Uh, so uh, there's a we, we've made some phenomenal changes, uh, and I, I would like to see. The young folks today uh, you know, use that as a launching pad uh, and overcome what we're going through now. Uh, the uh, because some and uh, ironically, where in the '60s we were trying to shoot for the moon, which President Kennedy started out in his administration, and we got there in, in 1969. Uh, uh, today we're trying to shoot for Mar uh, I believe it's Mars. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, so there's, there's a lot, a, a number of si uh, similarities. Uh, but again, I think uh, we will get there if we have optimism. And, uh, uh, and, and, and not so much the pessimism. And it's up to you folks to uh, you know, bring that to the forefront. Because we're all tired and worn out. You know? <laughs> We've done our thing. We've got a about two minutes left, and I just wanted to quickly kind of get both your takes on the State of the Union speech last night. I know we touched upon it briefly there, uh, kind of a bit of a non sequitur to what we were just talking about. But, uh, uh, you know, since we talk about civil discussion, uh, well, <laughs> that was something different from what I remember uh, watching when Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan were, were doing those speeches, a uh, whole different uh, uh, theater aspect to it. Um, Professor Dickinson, we'll start with you. Your, your feelings about it? Uh, was that a good speech? Was it effective? Was it what he had to do? Because I guess the idea was that President Biden had to 
you know, kind of uh, demolish the idea that at 81 years old, he's too old and feeble to be president for another term. Yeah, well, we're, as Addie's pointed out, that we're in an unusual time. That was a campaign speech. State of the Union addresses are not normally campaign speeches. He mentioned his predecessor uh, 13 times, not by name, of course, but you don't do that in a State of the Union speech. But that speaks to the fact that we have an ex-president running against the incumbent president. And you're absolutely right. The tone, the aggressive tone from the start was designed to send a message, which is I am vigorous. Um, I'm on top of my game. Uh, it was one of the longest State of the Union speeches in in modern history. In fact, um, if you add average all his State of the Union speeches, uh, he speaks more words than anybody. Um, it was a laundry list of things that he's done and promises that he's going to try to accomplish. They weren't all accurate, but that's the nature of a campaign speech. Uh, so that's why it was unusual. You don't usually see a campaign speech in the State of the Union address, but that was it. That was the launching of his campaign. If you were in charge, President, down in the White House, uh, uh, on, on that speech, would you uh, would you have uh, uh, changed the whole tone to make it a speech for unity to bring the country back together, uh, or am I just whistling? Uh, I had this discussion with a colleague this morning, and he said, "You know, we're, you know, you, you're not even on Earth anymore." I mean. Uh, I, about talking about unity. There, there, there can't be unity. Uh, and I thought he had an opportunity last night to uh, speak to uh, unity, uh, but that, that wasn't the case. Uh, well, I had hoped that he would speak for unity, that he would say what uh, we have in common, and let's build on that. But I think the reality is, among the political class in an election, uh, which he was viewing this as, uh, it's not as if he was recently elected and was speaking to the, reunite the nation. I mean, he's on the attack because he's in the middle of a campaign in which he's behind. And there's accusations or accusations is the wrong word, but there's a belief that he's not up to the job. And, and so I just think uh, his advisors probably said, this is going to be your biggest audience until the convention. You better make your speech right now for why they should vote for you and not for the other guy. Do I wish it was different? Yeah. But then did you see how one side was standing and constantly applying and cheering? The other side was sitting on their hands. I mean, that's the state of the political class in this country. There's a real cost to that, Don and Andrew, as I've talked about before. It turns a lot of people off from politics. But this was a political event. And so I understood the strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or the catcalling, uh, and that uh, also, and and the unusual wardrobe <laughs> choices that some some of them made. Well, uh, I guess we're going to have to leave it there for today. Uh, I, have we lost Addy? I looks like he's vanished from our screen here. Um, but uh, wanted to thank you both for for being with us and uh, engaging in uh, uh, what's always a very inter interesting conversations with with uh, with both of you. Um, so, uh, I guess, Don, uh, you know, I guess that's a wrap for today, but uh, thank you, uh, Professor Dickinson, and thank you, Addie, um, where, wherever you are, wherever she may have gone to, uh, but that's what we get with, uh, with Zoom technology, but that's okay. Better, better that than not at all. So, yes, uh, well, thank you both for having me on. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and we're glad to have a visit again. Well, Thanks, uh, and don't go too far because we will definitely be calling you again to uh, <clears throat> have you uh, offer your analysis of uh, what's going to be happening over the next, what, eight months or so? Anyway, <laughs> if, we could all, if we could all survive. Yes. <laughs> That's the challenge. Well, and thanks to all of you who have been with us and uh, sharing part of your day with us. We'll see you again the next time. Take care. Mm -hmm.